A few weeks ago, I took an old clock I found at Goodwill and turned it into a fancy wall clock. I used a technique known as book matching, and the final product was very pleasing. So I decided to keep going with that book matching technique and make a pen box with a book matched top. But then I thought, why make one when I could make a whole bunch at the same time? After all, it is the holiday season and I have a bunch of craft shows to sell my goods at. So today, I will be making a whole batch of walnut book matched pen boxes. And as usual, it is primarily for your viewing pleasure. Enjoy. Now the first thing I did was break down a rough cut piece of walnut into smaller pieces that were about 7 inches long by 4 inches wide. These will be used to make all of the book match tops. I decided to make the bottoms using the same technique, because a top that is a different color than the bottom might surprise people when they open it up and actually see the bottom for the first time. After the first run through the table saw, I have pieces that are about an inch wide, an inch thick, and seven inches long. I actually need to cut them down lengthwise twice more, and the smaller the pieces get, the dodgier the cuts become, and the more vulnerable my fingers become. So as a bit of a safety measure, I made this little jig out of some scraps. It holds the pieces, now less than half an inch wide, snug against the table saw fence, so that I can run them all through the blade in moderate safety. I feel like in every video I explain that I should really be using a bandsaw instead of a table saw. But behold, I still do not have a functional bandsaw. Behold, this is a mildly commemorative day. For exactly one year ago, I uploaded my first video. It was fairly low quality, about the same quality as my videos today. And if you thought this was a silly speech ending in a massive thank you to everyone who has ever been on the internet, it's not. Your own! I glued up all the book matches over the course of several days, and it took me several days because these two bar clamps are the only parallel style clamps I have, so I had to glue them all up one at a time. That was a long and tedious process, but luckily I am completely overwhelmed by the amount of projects I am working on at the same time, so I had plenty of other things to do while I waited for the glue to dry. Some of the glue seams didn't line up perfectly, either from my carelessness or because the two pieces were slightly different thicknesses, so I fixed this by running them through the planer, and the pieces were so thin that I had to use another board to raise the thin pieces up slightly so that the planer knives could reach them. The first piece I used to achieve this ended up pranking me and firing the cannon right back at my hand. Now it was time to turn to making the sides of the boxes, and for that I used more walnut. All the walnut I am using these days is actually from big walnut logs I milled last year. They are finally dry enough for me to use, and it is very convenient to use wood I milled myself. As usual, I broke the pieces down using the planer, the miter saw, which still has a blade as sharp as a tennis ball, and my table saw. Because I don't have a joiner, I use the table saw to get the board edges square. I do this by taking a very thin pass on one side and then flipping it over and using that side as a reference against the fence and running the other side through the blade. Doing this two or three times results in almost perfectly square edges. You might think that this video is becoming pretty repetitive, and you'd be right. Sean Covey said, we become what we repeatedly do. And I am repeatedly cutting things up with big power tools, which seems to imply that I, too, shall be cut up with big power tools. And since we are getting warmed up with the quotes, here's one from Edith Gergstrom. The eye loves repetition, but does not want to be bored. It likes familiarity, but needs surprises. So in order to be surprising, the next 20 seconds or so will be played in reverse. Upside down, flipped around, mirror image, and whatever this might be, 
We are finally through all the milling in this video. Now for the fun stuff. Cutting 45 degree angles on all the pieces. I set up a stop block so that I would get consistent cuts and cut all the long sides first. Then I adjusted the stop block as was necessary and cut all the short pieces. The most challenging thing about cutting these 45 degree angles is actually getting the blade set to a perfect 45. After that is done, it's quite fun and doesn't take much time at all. It's similar to how it takes a long time to build a house, but it does not take a very long time at all to go into a house. I tried to come up with an example that a lot of people could relate to. After all the 45s were cut, I needed to cut a thin groove in both the tops and the bottoms of all the side pieces, so that the top and bottom could rest in those. This will make sense in a minute. I basically just ran them all through the table saw a bunch of times. You might notice that I set the camera up in such a way where my head is cut out of the frame. We can fix that. And now we see the purpose of the grooves. There is a groove at the top for the top, and at the bottom for the bottom and the fit is very snug indeed. With all the pieces cut out and ready for assembly, I sanded everything, just because it was going to be a lot easier to sand it now, rather than after everything is glued together. To assemble the boxes, I took two short pieces and two long pieces and laid them down in an alternating fashion upside down on my table saw. I then took a piece of blue tape and connected them all. This will hold them all in place and make sure it is very easy to fold it into a box. From there, I just flipped it over, applied glue to the corners, and folded it up. I took some time making sure everything was aligned well before securing it with one final piece of tape. I then repeated this process for all of the boxes. After the glue had dried, I took the time to assert total dominance and take off all the pieces of blue tape. I was pleasantly surprised that the joints between the corners were quite tight and overall generally suitable. The next thing I had to do was cut the boxes in two in order to reveal the tops. The last thing I had to do was create a way to hold the box top in place. And to do this, I decided to line the box with a second smaller box made out of a slightly lighter colored wood. This will make a friction fit for the box top and add a nice look to the inside of the box. I cut several thin strips out of this pecan wood and then cut them down to approximate size necessary to fit inside the box. From there, I used my mini disc sander to sand a perfect 45 to fit inside the box. This actually worked quite well, so much so that I struggled a great deal to get the pieces back out after test fitting them. After getting them back out, I applied a bit of glue and pressed them into place. The fit was really snug, and I really liked the two-tone action on the inside. When all the pieces were in place, I added some clamps. This wasn't at all necessary, the pieces would have been just fine without the clamps, but a glue up without clamps just felt strange, so I added the clamps anyway. I apologize for not taking more time to film the finishing process in a more suitable manner, but I was on a time crunch before a weekend craft show, and getting the boxes done in time for that took priority over perfect documentation. I applied three coats of semi-gloss polyurethane. I'm really happy with how these turned out, and as of recording this, I've already sold two of them to people at crafty events. Thanks for watching to the end. This one felt kind of chaotic and really long. Until next time, go chase a turkey. Goodbye.